today's talk is uh, some bread and butter general surgery. Um, we'll be talking about pulmonary intestinectomy. This is really not meant to be like a thoracic talk. It's meant to kind of be more so a talk about managing um, like complex oligometastatic uh, colorectal cancer and maybe sarcomas, but um, we'll just kind of jump right in because I have a lot of slides um, that we may or may not get through all of. But um, so the aims, we'll, we'll talk about kind of, you know, patient selection for metastasectomy. That's a lot of what um, is key to performing these procedures successfully. Some of the background data that's a little bit more historic, but still is the basis for what we do. Preoperative workup that applies not just to these patients, but really to anyone being considered for a pulmonary resection, whether it's anatomic or non-anatomic. Some basic surgical considerations we're really not gonna talk about very much that's technical. Uh, and then questions related to specific cancers, really primarily colorectal and soft tissue sarcoma, and then a single slide on some other cancers. Um, and go from there. I uh, tried to pepper in as much evidence as possible to hopefully give some good takeaways from the talk. Um, but when, when performing metastasectomy, it's important to really be clear about your treatment aims, and they're going to be different for different patients. Um, there are some patients for whom really the goal is to, to offer a, uh, a chemo holiday or to render them, whether it's permanently or temporarily, disease-free. Um, there are patients who truly have oligometastatic and slow-growing disease after long disease-free intervals who we actually hope to extend their progression or disease-free survival. It's questionable whether or not we're really changing their overall survival, but some of that data is encouraging, uh, even though it has a lot of selection bias. And then there are rare instances where symptom palliation can be an incident, uh, an indication for surgery if someone has, for instance, you know, a bleeding metastasis that's encroaching on their bronchus or uh, encroaching on a hilar uh, vascular structure, that would be a reason uh, to perform a metastasectomy as well, or treat it with non-surgical local therapy. Um, important candidacy for any metastasectomy, whether you, know, you, could, you could change the word pulmonary in the first line to, to hepatic, for instance, um, but really is to consider, um, you know, this is from the NCCN, you, you kind of have to be able to get an R0 resection, otherwise you're doing the patient no favors. Um, in the case of any pulmonary resection, you know, do they have the adequate cardiopulmonary function, not just to tolerate the procedure, but then to be left with some diminished version of, of what they started with? Um, can you offer them some maintenance of function, preferably with a long sparing approach? Um, and is there extra pulmonary disease either controlled or controllable? Um, and then there can be uh, select indications for re-resection um, in these patients phrased differently. Kind of the flip side of this is the contraindications would be someone who has either an uncontrolled primary malignancy, the inability to achieve an R0 resection. Generally, positive mediastinal lymph nodes are, are seen as a contraindication to pulmonary metastasectomy just because it portends such a poor prognosis. And then um, the presence of not additional non-pulmonary metastases, so if they have synchronous um, other metastases, although this is really controversial for colorectal cancer, NCCN says uh, hepatic or pulmonary mets, really it should say hepatic and or pulmonary mets because people are treated under that paradigm. Um, so in, when considering those factors and looking at your patient, you have to take into account not just their age, but also their ultimate cancer-related life expectancy or if they have other comorbidities that may ultimately kill them before this slow-growing oligometastatic cancer for which they're likely asymptomatic. Um, what has been their previous response to other treatments? These patients have all presumably uh, seen chemotherapy before. If they have not, uh, what are their treatment options? And what was their, their course before they presented to you for metastasectomy? What was their disease-free interval? This is something we'll talk about a lot in terms of prognosis. Uh, and then what is the anticipated morbidity and mortality with resection? The bulk of what we'll talk about is wedge resection, um, but uh, there are instances where someone will have a deeper metastasis or one that abuts um, more critical structures, and you really have no choice but to perform a lobectomy. Uh, and then ultimately, uh, things like pneumonectomy are, are extremely rare. Um, the data for this is um, really a, a bunch of large prospective series and uh, registries that are kind of shown here and ultimately resulted in this expert consensus document in 2019. But it should just be taken into account that really a lot of these registries involve mixed cancer types. They can be kind of grab basket um, registries of patients with different tumors, different tumor biology. Um, and their greatest contribution tends to be from colorectal cancer and sarcoma. So that's why that's the focus of my talk. Um, there are other large institutional series um, and then really a lot of expert consensus and opinion. So we're not necessarily dealing with the highest quality of evidence here, uh, 
uh, shown here is you know this most recent. Sorry, I'll try to move this um, expert consensus document that really just highlights the the state of the data. Um, and shows that really we're dealing with no randomized trials. There's a pervasive selection bias. Um, let me see. If, sorry if I can move this to let y'all see. But um, okay. Um, and there's there's just lots of inconsistencies and heterogeneity that need to be taken into account when you're really analyzing this data. Um, before we jump into some of the larger series and sort of what they have given us in terms of data. Um, you know, some good takeaways or maybe things to have in mind would be some of the historic prognostic factors that we take into account when considering a patient's candidacy for, candidacy for pulmonary metastasectomy. You know, their disease-free interval, um, generally a cutoff of less than one year portends a poor prognosis, age, um, you know, the reason for a, a younger age uh, being associated with an increased risk of recurrence is probably multifactorial, but you know, these patients live longer and they may also uh, be developing more biologically aggressive tumors. Uh, the number of metastases at the time of first resection, if you're discussing a patient's uh, colorectal cancer, you know, certainly their preoperative CEA, um, although we know that as many as 20% of patients are going to be CEA non-secretors, um, and then whether or not they have synchronous or, metas or metachronous uh, lesions at the time of their uh, first diagnosis of metastases, and then whether or not they have uh, intrathoracic nodal disease that portends a, a very poor prognosis if preoperatively they have like pet avid nodes. That should really give you pause about undertaking a testectomy for these patients. And so we'll talk a lot about oligometastatic disease, but this slide is just to show that really there is no consensus. Um, data that is retrospective uh, would suggest that fewer than three is what you would like to see, uh, but there are lots of patients who have slow growing tumors and maybe five metastases that are all peripheral, easily wedgeable, those sorts of things. So really, ultimately, the, the potential for R0 resectability is probably what is more important. And then there's some other data in sarcoma literature about the number of lobes involved, as opposed to the pure number of metastases that one has. But there's no evidence-based limit to really what is the definition of oligometastatic disease. Um, the historic data upon which this is based largely comes from this registry, the International Registry of Lung Metastases. This is actually published, I mean, I, I don't know, I was in like second or third grade when this was published, but it still is the basis for a lot of what we do. Um, the, it's really like I described kind of a grab bag registry, though, of, you know, thousands of patients, um, thousands with kind of epithelial tumors. This is a broad category that actually included, you know, some breasts, it included other forms of epithelial tumors. Um, sarcomas, germ cell tumors, and other things, they uh, looked at risk factors really for uh, disease, for survive, risk factors for uh, recurrence-free survival and overall survival, and ultimately found, you know, their overall survival at five years is about 36%, you know, certainly diminished at 10 and 15 years, but their multivariable regression really pointed out three main things, germ cell tumors, disease-free interval greater than 36 months, and then the presence of a single metastasis at the time of diagnosis as positive prognostic factors. This is just a survival curve if you underwent a R0 versus incomplete resection. And then if you had germ cell tumors, like I mentioned, disease-free interval uh, greater than three years, and then a single metastasis, and then they put those together as risk factors. And if you had none, one, two, or were unresectable, the survival curves really did uh, pan out to be somewhat different. Um, and so the, the, that's kind of the basis in terms of, you know, how we look at patient selection, candidacy, um, and really starts to talk about these things in a multidisciplinary forum. But the other piece that's obviously very important and uh, goes into the workup of any general thoracic patient who's going to undergo a lung resection is their preoperative workup. And so as it pertains to their original cancer, um, CT is really going to be the best modality uh, in terms of assessing the chest for number location and the technical receptability of these metastases. And then generally speaking, a PET is also going to be useful if their original primary was a PET avid tumor to look for intrathoracic nodal disease and additionally stage the patient uh, for other sites of synchronous metastases. In terms of their pulmonary function workup, we should always remember, and this does actually come up on the app site, but um, you know, spirometry is probably the key uh, in terms of assessing someone's preoperative candidacy for varying pulmonary resections. Um, generally, a preoperative FEV1 greater than two liters suggests the patient would be suitable for a pneumonectomy. Uh, if you had to broadly say the contribution of one lung versus the other to a patient's respiratory function is about 45% on the left, 55% on the right. Uh, 
just because the heart uh, in, kind of impedes um, the, the left lung and it's slightly smaller. Generally, uh, FEV1 that's pre-operated at 1.5 uh, can let a patient undergo a lobectomy and even less for a patient to undergo uh, a wedge. Uh, but you want to have a post-operative predictive uh, FEV1 between 800 and uh, 1,000 cc's. You can do split lung function testing. DLCO is really the most sensitive um, predictor of post-operative uh, survival after a pulmonary resection. And then if there's ever doubt, cardiopulmonary exercise testing and assessment of VO2 max is probably the ultimate um, bailout. It's just a bit um, labor intensive to obtain. Um, and these values can change with preoperative pulmonary rehab and uh, other things that we do for patients uh, beforehand. Um, my plan is not to go into the technical considerations of these procedures because it's really wedges that we're mostly talking about. Yeah, Beth. What's the role of the DCT? Like, what about that for like, mm -hmm. work up as well? Um, but I also see a lot of like, numbers as well. So, for, for uh, quantitative VQ, that can be used to follow up your spirometry, especially if you think you have a lesion that. Um, you know, their, their pulmonary function is somewhat marginal, but especially if you have a lesion that's, you know, obstructing or partially obstructing a bronchus and you think what you're about to resect minimally contributes to their overall respiratory function because it's collapsed or obstructed or atelectatic anyways, that is a great uh, way to kind of prove that and say, yeah, they're starting with this FEV1 and by just the numbers, I would expect to reduce it by 25%, but this lung is not contributing to what's going on. So in fact, I would reduce it by say 8%. It can be a clarifying test after your spirometry uh, is probably the best instance for it. Um, in terms of the, the extent of resection, really achievement of R0 is the key. Um, the, the location will really determine whether or not a patient can safely undergo a wedge versus if they need to ultimately undergo a lobectomy, which although this is a more oncologically sound procedure is a bigger procedure it's a much bigger resection. And really, um, we know that the tumor is already not necessarily contained to the lung. We're talking about metastasectomy. So performing a lobectomy is not necessarily mandatory. Uh, pneumonectomy is, is outright really discouraged. Um, patients who are post-pneumonectomy should be thought of as being left with a new disease because being post-pneumonectomy, you will never be normal. Um, and then from the same registry that I showed earlier, these are the rates of, of various resections, again, back in kind of the 90s. Um, the technique for pulmonary metastasectomy, um, you know, there is a lot of dogma about open thoracotomy allowing direct palpation of tumors. Uh, probably the instance that where this continues to be a holdout is in the setting of metastatic adolescent osteosarcoma. Um, and it's true, you can palpate the tumors. But uh, modern high-resolution CT really does identify the vast majority of even small or what would likely be palpable nodules. Um, and to be honest, I mean, during a VATS procedure through your utility incision, uh, you can generally mobilize the lung enough that you can actually palpate a lot of peripheral nodules as well. Um, in terms of offering a uh, MIS or VATS or robotic uh, approach, this is done, I would say, the majority of the time in the adult literature. Uh, there's no difference in survival, whether it's disease-free survival or overall survival, and there is a lower morbidity. Uh, in terms of bilateral lesions, we'll talk about um, some data related to that, but you can do stage or simultaneous resections, and overall, this is a low mortality procedure for, for well-selected patients. Um, there are various incisions for VATS. Uh, this just shows some examples of a two-incision technique, um, some, example, some examples of a three-incision technique. This, if, if you're having to kind of think about the most versatile and workhorse approach for almost any VATS procedure, wedge, lobectomy, evacuation of hemothorax, decortication, the anterior approach is a is a um, probably the most commonly used uh, through a three-port technique. Um, the posterior approach is something that's uncommonly used. And then it's always smart to also kind of mark out your patient in case they do need conversion to an open procedure before you've prepped and draped and kind of distorted landmarks and those sorts of things. Um, in terms of some data about uh, the actual technique for these procedures to be done, uh, there is actually some investigation about thoracoscopy versus thoracotomy in uh, the, the pediatric realm of metastatic osteosarcoma. Uh, and really, you know, if these patients have true oligometastatic disease, my last bullet point, you know, there is no difference in, in disease-free or overall survival, suggesting that there's equipoise and there's an ongoing trial that's actually sponsored by one of the guys we rotate with downtown, uh, John Dosky. Um, the, in terms of should these patients be simultaneously or staged in terms of their resection of bilateral um, metastases, this is a, a paper out of MD Anderson. It was actually influenced by the COVID pandemic where, so, you know, 
a lot of their patients fly in for treatment and they didn't want to fly in twice and kind of quarantine twice uh, in the setting of COVID. Uh, and so they had kind of 36 patients that were kind of highly selected and underwent um, uh, simultaneous procedures versus those that underwent stage. Really, there was no difference in terms of the uh, operative success, but obviously, you know, understandably, there's a shorter length of stay and shorter OR time, but these are not even actually bilateral bats. The, a lot of these patients are doing bilateral, posterolateral muscle sparing thoracotomies, um, which um, they have a whole kind of ERAS protocol and do these in a very minimally invasive fashion at MD Anderson, but um, suffice it to say that in highly selected patients, it can be done in a simultaneous fashion safely. Um, the next question in terms of, you know, you have this patient in the OR, what do you need to do about the nodes? Is, you know, the cat already out of the bag? You know, they have metastatic cancer. Is there any benefit to going and getting the nodes? Um, you know, certainly for, for uh, native pulmonary cancer, you know, the most recent recommendations from the ACS suggest that there is a benefit in systematic nodal sampling, but unlike the, the primary lung cancers, there's really no proven benefit um, to, to systematic node sampling or formal lymphadenectomy in the setting of met metastatic disease. Um, but what it does tell us is that if someone has positive nodes, they have a, a decreased overall survival. Uh, and so it's very important prognostically. You probably don't need to do a formal lymphadenectomy, but you should do formal lymph node sampling um, for these patients. Um, and so that's kind of the, the broad strokes of metastasectomy in general. And then we'll touch on some, uh, some interesting kind of clinical questions for specific cancer types starting with the metastatic colorectal cancer. Um, so just generally speaking, you know, colorectal cancer, it does present with metastatic disease in up to one out of five patients almost. The liver is the most common site of metastases with the lung being second, but we know that resection of isolated metastatic disease can improve uh, overall survival to as much as, you know, in the 40 to 50% range at five years versus and th this number is probably better these days, but historically less than about 10% without resection. Um, and about half of patients with pulmonary metastases present with this metastasis at their uh, time of initial diagnosis. The other half tend to be found on surveillance. Um, so obviously appropriate selection is key in terms of who can get that R0 resection of their oligometastatic disease. And then just one thing, you know, if you have a, a lung tumor and it comes back undifferentiated adenocarcinoma, there are some stains that you can ask your pathologist to add to differentiate lung versus colonic adenocarcinoma from the outset. Um, so what is some of the kind of survival after uh, pulmonary metastasectomy uh, for colorectal cancer? This is probably the biggest and, and best quality series here, um, also predominantly from MD Anderson. Um, and basically they had uh, a little over 200 patients who underwent uh, metastasectomy their independent risk factors for death were, were age, male sex. This is questionable. Other papers have suggested female sex. So I, I don't know that that uh, has a, a biologic explanation that one sex necessarily does worse than the other. And then again, the presence of three plus metastases at the time of resection. Uh, and then their independent risk factors were, for recurrence were similar uh, with the addition of disease-free interval less than three years. Um, for colorectal cancer, you know, is there is there data on like what margin we should get? You know, I keep saying R0, R0, R0 but there's some additional data that suggests that a slightly wider margin will reduce your risk of recurrence. This figure is a little bit complex, but basically if you have, by way of example, sorry, if I can find my cursor, um, a tumor that is two centimeters and you take a margin, so I'm not sure why that's cut off on the left screen, and you take a margin that is just, we'll say just negative, so 0.1 centimeters or one millimeter, they found that your risk of recurrence, you know, it's going to be greater than 20%. And for each incremental increase in the margin, it, it will decrease really to a point, their benchmark of um, less than about 10 to 11%. If, if your margin is at least about half the size of your nodule, you will get your uh, recurrence to about that, that benchmark of less than about 10%. So that's kind of a good uh, takeaway. Uh, this figure is a little bit busy, but uh, it's a useful uh, takeaway from this paper. Um, and then there is some data to suggest that mutational status uh, within the cancer itself does influence their uh, disease-free survival, namely RAS and uh, TP53 being associated with reduced disease-free survival. APC is improved, but I, I don't know that that's necessarily that the APC is a good mutation versus it just describes if it's found in isolation, kind of garden variety colon cancer compared to those with a KRAS or a TP53 mutation. Um, and then lastly, there's, there's some data about uh, uh, differences in survival for primary tumor location, um, namely with uh, rectal cancers really doing worse than, than left-sided primary colon cancers. 
uh, shown here. Um, briefly, we'll run through some stuff about soft tissue sarcoma. Um, you know, this is theoretically a great candidate for pulmonary metastasectomy because it's known to spread hematogenously as opposed to through the lymphatics, but that's probably an oversimplification. Um, the seven-year overall survival is shown here. It's similar to, to other uh, metastasectomy data, and there may be some improved survival for pediatric uh, osteosarcoma compared to adults. Um, but we should also keep in mind that really soft tissue sarcoma itself is another kind of grab bag term uh, that describes a heterogeneous group of uh, various cancers. Um, we can more or less skip this, but this is just a, a study in adolescence suggesting a uh, survival benefit um, on uh, well-matched uh, propensity scored patients uh, with relapsing osteosarcoma. The only instance in which there was a questionable benefit was uh, in the setting of more than uh, three lobes involved with metastasis at the time of diagnosis, but otherwise this forest plot shows fairly universal uh, success. And then there is another follow-on uh, question of, you know, should we be doing repeat metastasectomy in these patients? Again, this is a highly selected group from MSK, but um, ultimately, despite some inherent selection bias in terms of those undergoing uh, repeat metastasectomy being younger, uh, more likely to be offered an MIS approach first, and uh, have a longer disease-free interval, it is ultimately safe and can improve survival in this highly selected cohort. Uh, and then there is also some influence on their primary cancer type with uh, leiomyosarcoma being one of the most favorable. Um, briefly, uh, metastasectomy for other cancers in terms of germ cell tumors, really non-seminomous germ cell tumors is what we're talking about. Seminomous germ cell tumors should be treated with chemo and radiation primarily. Uh, renal cell carcinoma uh, can be done selectively um, although this um, part of the reason for this benefit of metastasectomy for renal cells because it's relatively chemo resistant compared to the other tumors that I've described, uh, breast cancer for carefully selected patients, melanoma again for carefully selected patients, and then head and neck uh, cancer is really um, is more so the exception than the rule um, for uh, the success of pulmonary metastasectomy. Um, there are non-surgical therapies um, that uh, will benefit these patients, namely SBRT or radiation and then uh, RFA ablation if patients are not candidates for SBRT. And kind of the way to, to think about that are, are these patients you know, high surgical risk from either a cardiopulmonary standpoint or just from a technical feasibility standpoint. Um, and then you know, certainly those patients who have short disease-free intervals and, and likelihood of continued recurrence and are really just not likely to, to tolerate repeated metastasectomies or those that frankly refuse surgery. For mm -hmm. uh, really, it's, um, I suppose it's, my understanding is really that it's more targeted effectively and kind of delivers a, a more focal dose right to the tumor and effectively kind of ablates it um, as opposed to RFA, which it also ablates, but you literally have to access the tumor with a RFA probe or device and, and heat it. Uh, as opposed to it being done with actual radiation. Yeah, so SPF is a standard mm -hmm. access to the device. So it's like, instead of, you know, you go back 50 years, mm -hmm. you know, you interact with radiation and all of that, and this is now a potential new thing that's in place for this. Farther away you get from that region, the dose stops being back. Thank you. Um, and then finally, just a single slide on uh, chemotherapy. Sorry. Um, really, um, you know, pooled analyses of, of patients with metastatic colorectal cancer shows kind of a marginal benefit, but uh, the most favorable uh, disease-free survival will be based on patients who really have good performance status, long disease-free intervals. Uh, lack of synchronous liver metastases uh, and the presence of a single metastasis with a low uh, uh, pretreatment CEA. Uh, whether or not this is you know, really representative of a 
a treatment effect of the chemo or more so a selection bias, I think is uh, something that's debatable. But the timing of this administration should really be influenced by their disease-free interval. Do they have other metastases? Do they have lymph node involvement at the time of your metastasectomy when you sample those nodes as described? And then do they have other second or third line options or is this kind of their only hope and perhaps something that when rendered disease-free is, is worth giving them a chemo holiday and then having in reserve should they re-recur? Um, ultimately, these decisions are complex and treatment planning should be done at a multidisciplinary setting. Obviously, this is not something that's done like in a silo just by surgeons. Um, taking all of these factors into account, you know, not just the patient's age, but their ultimate real life expectancy. People can be physiologically very different ages, despite both being 65. Their performance status and cancer-related prognosis. Um, and their earlier response to treatment uh, is important, as well as their disease-free interval and any anticipated morbidity with your resection. Especially, you know, for instance, if they have a deeper nodule and you're, you're planning to offer someone who's in their 80s a lobectomy, uh, that's, that's no small undertaking. Um, so I just have a couple of slides left really about the future directions of the subject. Um, you know, these, these registry data um, really don't include patients that were turned down from a metastasectomy. We really don't have a control group. We don't know the true denominator um, to really kind of make uh, good assumptions. Um, propensity scoring for data in the future would, would add something as would kind of Bayesian approaches um, to consideration of kind of prior treatment probabilities. Um, but really, you know, there is no prospective randomized data on the subject and there needs to be, uh, because I think we've probably gleaned all that we can from these institutional series and registries, but also this treatment paradigm is, you know, kind of, you know, well on its way and, and rolling, but uh, so there is some consideration that physicians and patients may, may think it's kind of too late for equipoise to really, you know, ethically do a trial. Uh, there's been one attempt at this, the, the Polmic trial shown here. Um, really, they, they planned to enroll, you know, several hundred patients. They were ultimately able to enroll 65, and it was close early due to lack of accrual, really for this reason. When you look at why patients were not enrolled, uh, a large number were, you know, the clinical team overrode the treatment protocol. It's not even necessarily patients that are, that are refusing to be enrolled in these trials. It's physicians, and we say the data is too good, when in fact, you know, all the data I just presented was heavily influenced by selection bias. I mean, I I like to do wedge resections and lobectomies, and I think metastasectomy is a great subject, but we should probably also get better data for it. Um, and then, although this is really underpowered to draw any conclusions from, um, their data uh, does suggest that there is equipoise. I mean, this is granted 32 versus 33 patients, but these groups are actually very well balanced in terms of their T and N stage, disease-free interval, number of lung metastases, kind of all the important risk factors we previously described. And although they're, they're um, uh, five-year survival was numerically better for metastasectomy in this underpowered analysis, it, it does suggest that also the five-year survival for controls is much better than we previously thought historically. And so that gap may be closing, and it's something that probably at the time is right for a randomized trial, whether or not it actually happens, I think remains to be seen. Um, that is my final thought, or final uh, uh, slide. Um, we can open it up for questions, but um, that's, that, that's all I got. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think you're exactly right that the, you know, good disease does better. And so you know, that's the one we want to cut out. But at the same time, like, if you need good disease in place, maybe in the end of the day, it doesn't, the patient doesn't do worse, but people, even beyond us, have this overwhelming, and, and patients, yeah. everybody has to tweak the lesion on the scan. And so they'll just keep getting chemo. I mean, the chemo holiday thing, I think, is real. Yeah. Um, you know, but 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 when it, when if that's your goal, you know, if you can't tell the patient that, I mean, you can't tell the patient that the patient's you know, got to add all the caveats. Mm -hmm. 